Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World Economic Forum on Africa. My name is Max Hall, and I work in public engagement at the World Economic Forum. This session is looking at the ocean. Over half the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. Billions of people rely, rely on it for food. And the world's ocean and coasts, they produce products and services worth an estimated $2.5 trillion a year. That makes it the seventh largest economy globally in terms of GDP. So the oceans are pretty, or the ocean is pretty important. It fills our lungs and it fills our stomachs and it fills our wallets. Yet it's under serious pressure from the climate crisis, from ocean acidification, from industrial scale overfishing and plastic pollution. So we're therefore talking about an action plan for the blue economy. Now, we only have about half an hour for this session, so it's short. Uh, it's a big issue. But hopefully we, get, we have long enough to get our message across, understand some of the challenges that, that are facing the blue economy, and importantly, some firm prescriptions of what we can do to protect and sustainably use this vital planetary lifeline. The session has been filmed and webcast live, and we're tweeting out under the hashtag uh, AF19. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by two people um, whose daily jobs and daily work um, involves grappling with this huge, uh, huge matter and complex matter. Uh, on my immediate left is uh, Didier Dogli, who is Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Port and Marine for the Seychelles, and Barker Mossai, who runs a civil society organization called Seeing Blue, um, which aims to empower young people to get active in the blue economy, um, and, uh, and also um, works uh, for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Trade of Mauritius. So quite a large portfolio, both of you, <laughs> portfolios both of you have. Um, uh, I want to start with you. Um, uh, if you could tell me um, how you think, so your, your, your organization is very much focused on, on young people. Um, can you tell me why you sort of feel that, that this is such an important issue, like what you're trying to do on the, on the blue economy? Why? Thank you very much. Um, so Seeing Blue is an initiative that was launched um, by the global shapers community, specifically the hub in Mauritius called the Portless Hub. And the reason why we started this initiative is um, in around 2012, Mauritius as an island realized that our ocean space was a thousand times bigger than our landmass. It is a, a, a space that's as large as Spain, France, UK, Portugal, Germany combined. Um, so we started thinking, what are we going to do with a blue economy? How is the ocean going to work for us? But a lot of these conversations did not necessarily include young people. And as an islander, we feel that the ocean is our birthright. And young people, young women in particular, and young people from coastal communities should be part of this conversation. So we decided to have an initiative that gives a platform to these young people to discuss what their aspiration for the ocean is, what they feel should be the priorities for the ocean, and empower them to champion uh, the ocean and the marine resources. And the way we did this is literally dunking them in the ocean. We feel literally stupid. Literally putting them in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Okay. We felt that being in the ocean would give them a different perspective of as to how beautiful our underwater world is, but also how fragile it is. I firmly believe that you cannot craft policy about something that you cannot see, that you haven't seen or experienced yourself. So this is why we uh, introduced young people to the ocean in 2014. And uh, the initiative has since expanded to the Seychelles. And um, the idea behind it was also that the blue economy should be owned by Africans and islanders. And this is a point that I would like to come back on later. OK. Um, uh, Minister, um, in, your, in your job and portfolio, your, your daily sort of um, uh, your island economy very much relies on, on the blue economy, as it were. Um, what, do you, what sort of steps are you, are you taking to, to try to, I guess, protect and but also sustainably use it? 
Well, thank you, for, first of all, for inviting me to be part of this session this afternoon. Um, well, Seychelles started um, back in 2012 when there was Rio Plus 20, and everybody was talking about the green economy. And I recall the small island states uh, in the Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Caribbean. Um, we were looking at our maps, and we didn't see a lot of green. We saw a lot of blue. So we said, um, well, so where's the green economy here? And we couldn't find it, really. <laughs> so we said, but ours is then blue. So instead of talking about the green economy, we started talking about, about the blue, blue economy back then in, um, in 2012. And Seychelles organized two summit on blue economy in Abu Dhabi, together with the government of UAE, um, to try and flash out the ideas and concepts so that people could better understand, or we at least, ourselves understand what do we mean by blue economy because there was no definition, there was no really clear um, description what really is meant by blue economy so that um, slowly people could better get a grasp of, of that concept. So what, what, what I just sorry to interrupt, but so what would you describe the, the, the concept as? Well, the, what we understood, um, you know, I think what came out of those discussion was that, well, the blue economy is first of all, um, a vehicle whereby we, um, we grow the wealth, we increase wealth, um, just like any ec economic activity does. But there must be um, better sharing of the, of the wealth that is created so that everybody is included, is inclusive in the process. But at the same time, there is the, the sustainability side of it so that we, we do conserve the um, coastal and ocean environment so that uh, we do still have a healthy and productive ocean space. And do you find the, there's, a, um, there's a dilemma between <clears throat> uh, an economy that um, relies, I imagine, enormously on, on tourism, so the need for growth um, and the need for creating those jobs, but also um, uh, that putting pressure on, um, on natural resources? Yeah, but the blue economy, I mean, part of the idea of the concept that we discussed was, um, was first of all, for us to, um, to see how we can better use the resources that we have. First of all, deal with the activities that we are doing now, economic activities, and then find new ones. With for the existing ones, first of all, how do you diversify? Um, and at the same time, add value. For example, if you take a, a fish, instead of just selling the fish and you get about 50% that is thrown away, that is not really used, but how, how can you increase the use of the same fish? So instead of using 50%, how do you use 90% um, of that fish? For example, you can use the skin to make... Um, I was going to say, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you can use the skin, for example, in uh, making handbags, fish skin leather and that sort of thing. The heads can be used to make oil, um, you know, um, and the bones can be used to make um, uh, animal feed and other things. So, so out of the same fish, the question is, how can I increase um, e effective use of the same resource? Okay. Okay. Um, that was one thing that came out because for the blue economy for us, it's a lot about innovation. It's about um, going down the value chain and <coughs> making sure that there is better use along the value chain so that um, at the end of the day, there is more value added to the same products. How do you... Um with, with the people you work with, how do you, how do you um, uh, emphasize this of, I guess, the importance of um, uh, that economy and um, natural resources aren't, aren't in, uh, in conflict with one another? Is that something you focus on? Or? Isn't that the million dollar question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whether the economy is a luxury that we cannot afford yet. But, um, you know, when you're from a small island developing state like Mauritius or even the Seychelles, you have no choice but to be sustainable because um, not being sustainable, you are going to be cutting off the branch on which you're sitting. Um, 
And when the, the idea of the blue economy started as a way to bring minds together on how can we balance this economic growth imperative with the environmental aspirations of not just civil society, but even policymakers. Um, and we started to see that our calls were being eroded and therefore affecting the value proposition of our tourism sector. Um, another sector which is very important to Mauritius is the seafood sector, which uh, employs over 10,000 people, in, especially women. Um, but then when you see that your tuna stocks are collapsing, what do you do? You can't sell something that's gone. Um, and in this respect, the, the opportunities presented by the blue economy have allowed it to, to think beyond what can be, beyond what we're doing already. Um, as Minister said, um, the blue economy is not just something completely new. There were sectors that already existed, seafood being one of them, tourism being another. Um, but the interesting part is the conversations that are starting to happen around what else can we do. In my opinion, areas such as biotechnology are very promising. Um, and countries like Mauritius and even African uh, coastal states have a wealth of biodiversity that can be tapped into for this sector that needs to be invested in now. Um, conversations are actually happening um, at the multilateral level on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction as well, which shows that there is the appetite for this particular sector. Um, as in, like, uh, when, you, when you say, I, just sorry to interrupt, sure. just um, uh, when you talk about biotechnology and, and biodiversity, mm -hmm. um, are you talking about, say, um, um, understanding sort of reefs in such a way that maybe uh, there's um, some biomimetic asset that you can use to create a medicine or something like that? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, even beyond going the intrinsic value of um, genomes and, and um, different species. One of the things which really struck me was um, there was this sponge harvested in some shallow waters in the Caribbean, which was in the 1950s, later identified as spongoridine, which became one of the core components of antiretroviral drugs. And this was a sponge in shallow waters. So you can imagine if we look further, what else can we find? And with seeing blue, what we found um, with the young people was, there was the appetite for innovation. There was this appetite to craft solutions that, are, that have not been thought out yet and blurring the boundaries between um, natural solutions, natural filtration barriers were one example of- uh, Natural filtration, filtration barriers. Filtration barriers uh, were one of the, the things that young people came up with to tackle pollution. Just to give you an example of the sort of ideas they came up with. But the challenge that they face is, because a lot of the conversations on the blue economy have focused on large investments, uh, third party investments, capital in intensive um, uh, projects, these small ideas were relegated or not really given a space to evolve. So this is why for me, inclusiveness and getting those small ideas, those small communities is really, really important because that's how we capture what else can we do with the ocean? So I'm going to ask you both uh, the same question. I'll, I'll go first to, first to you, Didier. But, um, I, you know, there's, there's this really exciting space in the blue economy. Yeah, we're talking about biotechnology. Yeah, you're talking about, um, I mean, and these are just individual examples where you're talking about sort of um, extending the use and the sort of value chain around um, a single, <laughs> yeah, around a fish. Um, where do you, what do you need to happen um, to really um, both, I'm interested both at a local community or local sort of national level, but also on, the, on an international level for, for really the blue economy to take off. And it's something that people are excited about. You can sense this excitement, but there must be sort of some barriers. So what are, what are the barriers that you need to, that need to fall down or need to be overcome? Well, I think the first thing, uh, one of the reasons why we had the summit was to try and get the awareness, get everybody to understand what is this all about. And I know that within the AU um, uh, strategic plan, development plan, um, now the blue economy features strongly into that. Um, so there's more countries talking about it. Uh, it's not only the islands now that's talking about the blue economy. So I think the first step is get the awareness, get everybody to understand and get everybody to be at the same level. Um, especially the coastal countries, the large coastal countries, because if you take Africa, most, most of their 
um, uh, resources are on land, and they've mm -hmm. always focused on the minerals that are the land, the large forests, and, and so on. Whereas we on the smaller islands, you know, you, you live basically on, on, on the coast. You're there almost on the beach. You know, it's, it's five minutes walk or ten minutes walk. It's not the same thing. So our focus has always been towards the sea rather than towards the land. Mm -hmm. So to try and get all the um, continental countries to move into that direction, I think is, is first of all the first step. One, once you have that awareness and then the policies, the politicians, uh, the political will will follow and then getting the, the plans into place and getting the scientists, um, the technicians, the experts to work together and then develop it further. Um, as far as the islands is concerned, because we've already done our strategic policy um, framework and um, which is already in place um, from 2018 to 2020, um, we've identified the priorities, the strategic priorities that we want to focus on. But for us to be able to do that, I'll take an example like mariculture. You know, Seychelles has got fantastic fisheries. But if we want to increase um, the amount of, let's say, a certain species which is of high value, then the next step is probably to farm it and go into aquaculture. Now, if we want to go into aquaculture, then you need to have the people who has been trained to, to, to manage aquaculture. At the moment, we don't. We have fishermen that goes out and fish, but we don't have farmers that, that manages fish. So you need to turn fishermen into, into farmers so that they farm the fish instead of go out fishing. Right. And then you need to have the, um, the biologist that does the... Um, all the scientific work at the back, make sure that the sea is clean, the bacteria is managed, and all these other things. So there's a whole new um, industry that needs to develop, and behind it needs to come the institutional framework, the legal framework, and also the technical expertise that you will need to make it work. And, and I've used fish as an example, but the same thing can be applied for renewable energy, um, on the ocean like OTEC and other forms of renewable energy that can be used at sea, it can be used for biotechnology that um, she has mentioned earlier and other forms of investment that can take place. So there's, there's a whole system and an all new way of thinking and um, A new and way of thinking that needs to come with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it needs to follow up behind it. Um, I mean, you must have mentioned the, ask, the example of, of biotechnology. You don't have to, I'm not asking just to speak specifically about that, but, the, but what do you have seen as some of the sort of hurdles that really need to be overcome? Okay, so um, at national level, I think I mentioned the need to make sure that um, policies crafted around the blue economy should be inclusive of everyone, especially coastal communities, young women, uh, youth, and this is where the skilling part, the education and capacity building part um, should happen. Um, but is, I it, is it happening? Is it? Um, I think in some ways, yes. But in other ways, I feel that we could be doing more. Uh, again, this comes to the concern that I had about the privatization, so to speak, uh, of oceans, where the focus being on corporate entities, corporate um, uh, big, big projects sort of crowds out smaller initiatives. So there needs to be this ownership. And um, in Africa in particular, a lot of the parties involved with the ocean are not necessarily African. So the, 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 the impulse for, um, the, the imperative for being inclusive has to be there. Um, this is at national level. Um, at continental level, perhaps I feel we are lagging severely in data. Um, data. Data. Um, I'm sure you must have heard that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do <laughs> about our oceans. Um, That's true, yeah. And it's particularly visible when we are negotiating, for example, in terms of fisheries, because we don't know what's in our, in our waters. We, it, it's very difficult. The materiality of the ocean is such that you cannot map what's inside the water. Uh, we don't have the capacities yet. Um, but the exciting part is that with the fourth industrial revolution, we're talking so much about autonomous drones, um, internet of, of things, and big data capture through low-cost sensors, 
these are technologies that are very exciting because they allow, they allow us to um, assess our oceans without having to be as uh, <coughs> present physically in the ocean. For example, there are autonomous drones that can drift alongside uh, along ocean currents for several years, capturing data over several years, um, providing a, snap a snapshot of the health of the ocean, um, which is really, really valuable data. So these are exciting technologies that we need to, to tap into. And um, during the conversations happening in, uh, at the level of the UN on BBNJ, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, the issue of tech transfer has come up a lot. Um, and I feel this is where we have to be very intentional about the type of partnerships that we are creating so that such technologies can be made available to uh, countries like Mauritius, to interested countries in Africa. Um, I almost feel that there should be like a technology for humanity kind of thing where these technologies should be available by default, you know, because the, the data captured will, be of, will benefit the whole of humanity. So data is one. Um, the correct intellectual property frameworks is another uh, regulatory framework that is needed to propel innovation in the ocean space. And thirdly, there needs to be the political will to put oceans at the forefront of the African agenda, of the global agenda even. Um, in Africa, two thirds of countries have a coastline. So this is something that um, is a huge opportunity for the continent and we definitely should be talking more about it and it should not be reserved only for scientists because oceans do also offer the opportunity for citizen scientists to come on board. We need a whole plethora of skills. And this and is where there's some inclusivity and the exactly. emphasis on civil society. Exactly. Um, I, I want to ask you if sure. um, we're, we're, we're quite sort of close on, uh, on, on finalizing time so I might need to ask you to keep your... <laughs> remarks brief, but um, I want to ask you something on finance, but before I do, um, perhaps we have some questions on the, on the floor? Yes? Can we, can we have a microphone over here? Can you say um, uh, your name and the, and the organization you work for, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Giovanni Pele. I'm a global shaper, but I'm actually asking a question on behalf of another global shaper from the Seychelles, um, Craig. Frank Rott. Um, so he mentioned that the blue economy is a positive way for small island developing states to diversify their um, economies beyond tourism and fisheries. Um, the question is, how can we leverage funding into the blue economy space to help address issues of social equity and social inclusion? Um, areas which typically don't get a lot of funding. So with the context, he said, um, we're struggling right now with drug trafficking and consumption and quality of education. Um, so how do we leverage that to get um, more development and more impact in those spaces through um, the progress you make in the blue economy? Is that a question for, for both panelists? Yes, okay. Sir? Want me to start? Yep. Well, Seychelles has already done a lot as far as funding is concerned. We've done the blue bonds, which was done in 2017. We raised 15 million US dollars with the help of World Bank and um, um, Jeff, Global Environment Facility. And the money, I mean, there's two vehicles where you can get access to the money. If you're in business, then you can, get, you can go to the, to the Blue um, Investment Fund through the Development Bank and you can get access to financing from there. And if you're an NGO or civil society, you can go to even a business, if you're doing research and that sort of thing, you can go to SECAT, Seychelles Conservation and Climate Trust, where you can get access to, a fine, to grants for you to be able to do research and so on. And also we've done um, debt swap um, with Paris Club, where we raise about 21 million US dollars worth of money. And every year there's about 400,000 US dollars, which is available for grants. So, um, and it's particular for coastal and um, marine research and, and livelihood and support that sort of activities locally within the Seychelles. So there's a lot of opportunities within Seychelles. Baka, question to you. Yes, um, actually this is a very good question because um, initially we thought that funding would be a big issue 
given that so much of so many of the projects require huge investments in infrastructure, in um, in technology. Um, but what we found is the interest in oceans is picking up. The number of conferences around oceans already shows that there's, there's that much um, of an interest. And um, we found that many huge, um, huge entities, many huge actors, including Salesforce, Microsoft, are ready to put funds at the disposal of ocean-related issues. So there's that avenue. Um, there's also a lot of interest around making our oceans safe. And this is something where Mauritius and Seychelles have played a, a big role in the Indian Ocean in tackling piracy. Um, and recently, we even hosted um, a conference on maritime security where um, the, the shipping uh, industry is very heavily involved. So those are areas where funding is already very readily available. Now, the question is more focusing on what are the projects that we need to bring to be bankable. So there's that, there's the innovative uh, mechanisms, and eventually, who knows, maybe we can have a bank for oceans or a blue climate fund. This could be an option that we consider eventually. You think, do, you, do you both think that the money is there? Just uh, it needs to be unlocked? Exactly. Well, I, <laughs> well, in the case of Seychelles, if you are talking, because we focus mostly on small and medium-sized enterprise, you know, because we believe that, you know, um, these are the ones that are more resilient. So um, the big guys can always get access to financing through the banks and so on. Um, but for you to be able to grow the grassroots and so on, you need to be able to make the money available. And especially when we're talking of inclusivity, um, you need to be able to make money available for those who have limited access to it. So if they have a very good projects, you need to create the, an enabling environment so that they get access to that. So that's where we really have put a lot of emphasis to start off with. Um, but as I've said, if you really want to invest, you go to the Blue Investment Fund through the banks, you'll get access to that money. Final, um, literally final minute. Um, uh, let's imagine we're having this session again in a year's time. In one sentence, um, what would you like to, what tangible action would you like to have seen happen um, between now and, uh, and, and a year from now? Barker, you first. Yeah. It could be anything, global, local, region, yeah, regional. Okay, can I, can I go for two? <laughs> <laughs> go on. Okay, the first one would be to have a very comprehensive agreement on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which would be a bit the constitution of the oceans, um, uh, outside of what's currently being regulated by the law of the sea. So this is one. And the second would be to have more young people and more women being actual actors in the blue economy, pushing forward the blue economy agenda and um, actually being at the head of those projects. This is what I would love to see in one year. Excellent, thank you. And did you? Well, I would like to see more results because we've got the plans. Now I would like <laughs> to see, those results? Like to see things results? happening. You know, it's, <laughs> that's the bottom line, bottom line at the end of the day. You, know, you just don't do plans and more plans and policies. You want to see the results. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.